Perspectives of Savitri Upakhyan by R. Y. Deshpande. But it is unfortunate that some scholars, though knowing its dignity well, should have freely romanticized the tale by narrating it to the audiences in the West. Let us read, for instance, a passage from one such lecture to see how amusing it can be. Savitri didn't find anyone she thought was worth her attention until she came to a forest. In the forest, there were some huts and in one of them was a king who was dispossessed of his kingdom on account of his enemies getting the upper hand. He lost his sight and became blind and dispossessed of his kingdom and driven out of his territory. He was living in the forest outside his kingdom. The king and queen were, so to say, living in exile and their son was looking after them. Savitri thought that this young man was really an ideal young man. So she decided in her mind to select him as her future companion. She came back from her travel to report to her father. And when she came back, Narad, the great divine sage, was sitting with the king and queen. They were talking when Savitri came. When the king asked about her choice, she declared her choice and said that Satyavan living in the forest was the person whom she had selected. The king thought that it was quite right because it was a choice. But he asked the divine sage Naru, pass this horoscope and see the position of the constellations in their future life and see whether this is happy. So Narad cast the horoscope and said, yes, this is all right, but there is one catch. This young man will die after one year. He's going to die after one year. Savitri insisted that she was going to stick to her decision and take the consequences. The result was that they were married. And after one year, the God of Death came and Satyavan died. But Savitri pursued the God of Death to his home in the upper regions or in whichever regions the dead go and she persuaded him to release the soul of Satyavan. Satyavan was revived and they went back home. This may be a good story, but it is not Vyasa's story as present in the original Mahabharata. It seems that the lecturer did not use the Sanskrit text, but went on by some secondary source when he introduced the legend to his American audience. Similarly, let us hear a part of another such version of Savitri myth. Yama has taken away the soul of Satyavan. Savitri pursues the god of death and entreats him to, her, to return her husband. But he is adamant. As she follows, they come to a zone where there is a large river which no human being can cross. But by the sheer force of her purity, of character, she the river, she crosses the river, confronts the god of death, and prevails upon him to return her husband. Surely, these are not the versions used by Sri Aurobindo for his magnum opus. It is true that there are any number of editions of the Savitri legend recounted differently in different regions, with local nuances adding to the confusion of interpretations. Poets of lesser caliber down the edges have often allowed fancy to run loose. The result is not very famous. If in one part of the country the day of Satyavan's death is observed to be the no moon night, in another it is full moon. These freehand exercises are often casual and prakritic without the elevating sublimity of the Sanskritic and the May, the tale a puerile and insipid document of decadent practices. But when we are chiefly concerned with Sri Aurobindo's Savitri, the safest thing to do is at least to follow Vyasa's original text. It has a dignity of substance, dignity of style, dignity of delight. It has throughout a general overhead atmosphere. In it, the idea seeds of the spiritual perception and truth knowledge are golden and bright, even if the tale is to be taken as a kind of pressy 
of universal metaphysics, put figuratively in the language of myth, it is also sufficiently it is also a sufficiently elaborate symbol carrying in its living and expressive details the power of occult workings of the transcendental in the modern world. The flame charge of the symbol is too esoteric, too sacred to be profanized. About it, Sri Aurobindo writes, The tale of Satyavan and Savitri is recited in the Mahabharata as a story of conjugal love conquering death. But this legend is, as shown by many features of human tale, one of the many symbolic myths of the Vedic style. Satyavan is the soul carrying the divine truth of being within itself, but descended into the world of grip death and ignorance. Savitri is the divine world, daughter of the sun, goddess of the supreme truth, who comes down and is born to save. Ashwapati, the lord of the horse, her human father, is the lord of tapasya, the concentrated energy of spiritual endeavor that helps us to rise from the mortal to the immortal planes. Dhyumatsen, lord of the shining hosts, father of Satyavan, is a divine mind here fallen blind, losing its celestial kingdom of vision, and through that loss, its kingdom of glory. Still, this is not a mere allegory. The characters are not personified qualities, but incarnations or emanations of living and conscious forces with whom we can enter into concrete touch and they take the human bodies in order to help man and show him the way from his mortal state to a divine consciousness and immortal life. This mystic symbolism of the tale gets further corroborated by his remark made during a conversation of 3rd January 1939. I believe that originally the Mahabharata story was also symbolic, but it has been made into a tale of conjugal fidelity. Satyavan, whom Savitri marries, is a symbol of soul descended into the kingdom of death. And Savitri, who is, as you know, the goddess of divine light and knowledge, comes down to redeem Satyavan from death's grasp. Ashwapati, the father of Savitri, is a lord of energy. Dhyumatsena is one who has the shining hosts. It is all inner movement, nothing much as regards outward action. The poem opens with dawn. Savitri awakes on the day of destiny, the day when Satyavan has to die. The birth of Savitri is a boon of the Supreme Goddess given to Ashwapati. Ashwapati is the yogi who seeks the means to deliver the world out of ignorance. Because it is the boon of the Supreme Goddess, it has the sanction of the Supreme. It only means that the great issues are presently involved in the creation and that they have to be dealt with the transcendent power acting in a decisive way. The operative phrase is the day when Satyavan has to die.